Here is how one Christian leader spoke recently. He was at a conference and replying to a question about suffering. This is what he said. We grew up in a country where our people group suffered. I went as a missionary to Africa, contracted typhoid and came close to death's door. I've had two or three other diseases that have almost taken me out. My wife's had cancer. She didn't expect to live to 50. She's just turned 60. And as a Christian leader, I've been through situations in churches and relationships that are really tough. Betrayals by fellow Christians that have been very painful. And then he ended his comments with these words. We are all under sentence of death. We are all terminal cases, and for some of us, barring a miracle, it will happen sooner than we'd anticipated. Who knows what the future will bring for us? What might happen sooner than we expect? In your household, there might be things that you're looking forward to in the next year. I'm expecting another grandchild to join our clan. We're not expecting a funeral. We're not anticipating terrible news about ill health or tragedy, but any of that is certainly possible, likely even. Haven't you had that thought at least at some points over something? How can God do this to me? And, you know, it's just, it feels like it's one thing after another, and I'm at my limit. All that I'm going through, he, he can't even see it. At least that's what it feels like. I pray my prayers, they're never answered. He no longer remembers or cares. I haven't changed, but it feels as if he has changed. Have you ever thought like that? Might that be a feeling that occurs to you sometime in the next 12 months? What will you do with your sadness? May I say that this, little Bible, this bit of the Bible will do you good today. This is what God speaks to you today, speaking right into your situation. And that is my first heading for today. You'll see there's an outline on the back of the notice sheet. My first heading is this, that God speaks comfort to sinful people. Let me paint a bit of the background of the story so far. The year is 750 BC. Uh, the nation at the heart of the Old Testament story is divided. It's split into two about 200 years before. And both of the halves of the nation are on a downward spiral, uh, deteriorating. There's a, a terminal decline. And the words of Isaiah are spoken to the southern half. At the point when there is a big bully in the playground, Assyria, who is threatening the northern half and the southern half. And the people are wondering what to do because Assyria is very big and very fierce. They flirt with possible military alliances. But the big message of Isaiah, it comes in chapter 7, is this. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Trust God, in other words. He's committed to you, what, however ominous your circumstance. Lean on him. And to cut a long story short, Assyria, this threatening bully, they do come. The northern kingdom gets carried off into exile and basically disappears from history. But just before our passage, we're told in chapters 38 and 39 that the southern half of the nation too, because they've not been faithful to God either. They've not stood firm in their faith, so they will not stand at all. They've not trusted him. So God says in chapters 38 and 39 that another bully, another superpower, Babylon, they're going to come along and they will take them away as well. Because that's exactly what God said we'd do if his people were unfaithful. They didn't stand firm in their faith. They would not stand at all terrible future for them. Now in our passage, Isaiah chapter 40, here is Isaiah speaking to the nation before that terrible tragedy happens, but he's looking years and years ahead. 
He's fast-forwarding the film to the time after that exile, after Babylon has carried them off. Isaiah looks through that terrible time to a better time that's going to come afterwards to say that God will bring them back again. They will return. God will rescue them. Look down to the first verses of Isaiah 40. God speaks comfort, comfort to his people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned that she's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. God speaks comfort to say he can get you out of that mess. It's over, he'll say. Be comforted. God's forgiven you. Verse 2, the iniquity that took you away has been pardoned. The sin paid for, the payment is double for all her sins. Double like we talk about somebody being an exact double or a double in a movie. The punishment that has been received is an exact match, a double for the sin that's been committed. God speaks comfort to his sinful people. Now what is it? What is this comfort that God speaks? And in the first bit of this passage, three voices now speak. Can you see it in verse 3, a voice cries. In verse 6, a voice says. And a third voice in verse 9, lift up your voice with strength. And These three voices tell us what comfort God speaks, what he says to us, what he speaks to us through these voices. The comfort that God speaks is God says that he is coming to rescue you. And actually, this is my first headline this morning. God says that he's coming to rescue his sinful people. Let's listen in to what each voice says. Voice 1, verses 3 to 5, God himself is coming to rescue you. When somebody famous comes, we roll out the red carpet to make the walk easy, comfortable, luxurious. When God himself comes to rescue you, look at these verses here. It's not a red carpet you need, but major earthworks. Create a highway for our God, end of verse 3. One of those Chinese 50-lane superhighways, but without the traffic jams. Or verse 4, fill in every valley on the route. Flatten down every uphill, every slope, every mountain. It's a massive civil engineering project. Mountains tipped into valleys to make a flat and easy route. Look, God is coming. The earth is moving. So, of course, verse 5, everybody will see it. This is something wonderful. God himself, in person, is bringing the comfort that he speaks about to people who are feeling far from home, abandoned, and forgotten. We tend to think that spirituality is all about people setting off on a long journey to find God. But the Bible doesn't tell the story of a lost shepherd tracked down by his searching sheep. No, it tells the story of John the Baptist pointing at Jesus and saying these very words to say, look, here he is. God has come. God himself has come. When Jesus came, he was doing exactly what Isaiah says here. No, what God says here. That's what the mouth of the Lord spoke, that God himself is coming. And, next little bit, verses 6 to 8, what God says is forever. You've got to wait till the end of verse 8. See, that's where the paragraph is going to end up. To to hear what this voice speaks. The word of our God will stand forever. But the thing, of course, is that we won't. Up and down the land, people are now discussing whether Buster the Boxer is as good as previous John Lewis tearjerkers. 
Costa Coffee have got their seasonal syrups. It must be Christmas. Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without the snowman, of course. The perennial favorite, the boy and his snowman, taking flight to the swelling chorus of walking in the air. Channel 4 has screened it every year since 1982. But do you know what the story of the snowman is all about? It's about death. Raymond Briggs wrote it as he was grieving the death of his father. And it was all the idea of the snowman melting was to introduce children to the idea of mortality. This is what he said. The snowman melts, my parents died, animals die, flowers die, everything does. It's a fact of life. Of course, ironically, the movie will outlast its creator. Raymond Briggs will die and Channel 4 will carry on showing the movie. But that is exactly what verses 6 to 8 says, isn't it? That every person is like a melting snowman. Or to use the picture here, every person is like grass. And the one thing you know about grass, we get told at the beginning of verse 7 and the beginning of verse 8. It withers. Every flower you pick and put into a vase, into the house to admire, or you give to your loved one as a symbol of your love, is a dying symbol of your love. As soon as you pick it, you sign its death warrant. It is dying. As every baby is born, another death is certain, sooner or later. But, end of verse 8, what God says is not like that. The promises he makes never fade. They never pass their best before date. They never go moldy and have to be chucked away. What God says never dies. What God says will stand forever. He says that he will rescue you. Yes, you lot, in Babylon. Well, be sure he will do it. And now voice 3 joins in, verses 9 to 11, to say again, God himself is coming. Look down to verse 9. In the days before a PA system, you had to go up onto a high mountain if you wanted to be heard. You had to shout with a loud voice, lift up your voice with strength, bellow it out, and say what? End of verse 9. Behold your God. Here he is. He's coming. And as he comes, it's as if he's rolling up his sleeve. Look at verse 10. See, there's his mighty, strong arm. As if he's saying, do you want to take this outside with me? And we say, uh, no thanks. Not now I've seen the massive biceps on your arm. God himself is coming, the strong and mighty God. Behold your God. And now see finally in verse 11 what he's coming to do. He's going to tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. 400 times the Bible says that people are most like sheep. Sheep aren't clever. We used to own four sheep. Let me tell you, they are very stupid. They are helpless when they fall onto their backs. They just stick their legs in the air and wiggle them. They stumble off cliffs. Sheep eat the wrong things. Sheep run off. Sheep get lost. Sheep are completely feeble and desperately need a shepherd. Israel, stuck in Babylon, they'd know how hopeless they were. How sheep-ish. They need rescue. All people need rescue. Sometimes we get shown how helpless we are, how sheep-ish. A lot of the time we think we're invincible, but of course we're not. We wither. We are sinful people who face death. And God himself says, I'm coming to rescue you to tend you, to gather, to carry, to lead. Behold your God is the loud shout of announcement. Which might sound like the end of the chapter and might sound as if I'd reached the end of the sermon. And you might be thinking, oh yes, please. 
But we're not there yet. The best bit is still to come. See, let's think just a little bit more. Let's imagine how this would feel to Israel. They've just been told a few verses before that they're going to be taken away into Babylon. And they're going to be in exile for 70 years. What can they hold on to? Well, they've got this promise, haven't they? They've, there will be a moment when God will speak this comfort that God himself is coming, that God himself is coming to rescue you and what he says lasts forever. Does that sound good? Hmm. Not so good as time passes by. 70 years is a long time, isn't it? I mean, it's a couple of generations, really, to hold on to what? Words? Just words? An empty promise? Won't it all feel a bit like verse 27? Just look over to verse 27, where we see exactly what Jacob and Israel will feel. My way is hidden from the Lord. In other words, it'll feel as if, do you know what? It feels as if God just can't see what I'm going through. How can he do this to me? Last line of verse 27, my right or my legal case, my appeal is disregarded. In other words, my prayers aren't even answered. He no longer remembers or cares. Now that is why the second half of Isaiah 40 is such good news. It's so important because God is answering that wistful lament of verse 27, that feeling that God doesn't care, that God's not coming. I know he said he would, but he's not, is he? There's no rescue. And what he's saying, and this is my second headline, do you doubt that God can do what he says? Come back to verse 12. I brought along some things to help us uh, get this uh, today. So, first bit of verse 12. How much water can you measure in a hand? It's not much, is it? Look at the beginning of verse 40. Do you know how the amount of water that there is in the oceans of the world? 1.3 billion kilometers cubed. God measures the oceans, all of that water, in the hollow of his hand. Space is huge. Next line in verse 12. There are 10 billion observable galaxies and 100 billion stars in every galaxy. How many stars is that? That's one with 21 noughts after it. Now, I can balance a toy globe in a span just if I'm careful. It's a toy globe and it takes all my grip, my little finger and my thumb. See what it says here, second line of verse 12? God has got at least one billion trillion stars in his grip plus all their planets and all their moons. Or look at the next line. Sorry, I'm not going to go through the whole chapter at this speed, but look at the next line. I've brought along in a bag here the dust from our hoover yesterday. <laughs> I know, it's gross, isn't it? All I can say in my defense is at least it's not lying around in our house anymore. I'm going to weigh it. Yet yeah, doesn't even make the needle flicker. Hardly registers. God weighs mountains and they're like dust to him. As small and inconsequential, as light and as airy fairy as the contents of our hoover. Mount Everest weighs 3.4 billion tons. I've no idea how Google knows this. <laughs> Three and a half billion tons are like dust on God's weighing scales. Verses 13 and 14. Do you think God needs your advice? Watching The Apprentice, we're now used to focus groups, aren't we? Market research. It's the field my daughter is in. She conducts 
focus groups. That's her business. Companies have them so they can sell their product. Politicians have them so they win elections. Even church denominations now have them to decide their theology. But God, do you seriously think he needs a focus group of people? Does he need our opinions and our wisdom before he decides what he thinks about something? Or verse 15, here's my bucket and a drop of water. That's Western civilization. That's, that's China, all 1.3 billion people. And there's the rest of the world. Verse 17, all the nations are as nothing before him, counted by him as nothing and emptiness. The current series on BBC One, the planet Earth 2, the, they have recorded 400 terabytes of footage. That's equivalent to 82,000 DVDs. God made it. God knows it. God sees it all. How on earth could you describe this God? Verse 18. As soon as you say that he's like anything, why that is to lessen him, to reduce him, to make him smaller, less significant. There's, there's nothing he is like. The category that he is in has got nothing else in it. Verse 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? He who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. When it's dark, we pull curtains across our window. God pulls galaxies across the sky. He's got a permanent Google Earth view, so no wonder we are like grasshoppers. And princes and rulers, verse 23, he brings them to nothing. He makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither, the tempest carries them off like the stubble. We're back to withering grass again, aren't we? God blows and Barack Obama and David Cameron disappear. And so will Donald Trump and Theresa May. They may have a couple of terms in office and then they'll become quiz questions on the back cover of the Christmas edition of the Radio Times. Some famous people I've never heard of. And Fidel Castro and the EU, and ISIS, and any army in its jack boots, and every civilization. Do you think they impress him? Do you think they scare him? What is it that he does with them according to verse 24? They are there and he... Just that, isn't it? Again, verse 25, to whom will you compare me? Is there anything, anywhere, that you could say, God's a bit like that? Because as soon as you might start to answer that question, Isaiah is there to say, uh-uh. Allah, Vishnu, all the brilliance of humanity, which of those was there when he created? And if he's the one who created everything, how can you say that he is like any thing? He's unique. A one-off. He is the only one. So then, come back to verse 27. Why do you say, my way is hidden from the Lord? As if he can't see what I'm going through. This is the Google Earth God. As if he disregards me. As if he no longer cares or remembers. Are you kidding? Please don't mishear me. It's not that God is too great to care. Of course not. It's that God is too great to fail. That's the point. 
He says he's coming to save you. But what he says is certain because he's like this. For the next years, during the exile, when these people of God desperately needed comfort and all Israel have got to hang on to are God's words, and they might start to think of these empty words, are these empty promises? No, of course his words can't be empty. How could they be empty? Of course his words stand forever. Of course the promises he makes are certain because the God who makes them is very, very big. So, Israel, you'll be in a mess. And you're in this mess because of your sin, because you are sheep-ish. Here's a question for you. How big is your ability to get yourself out of this mess? Or to put it another way, would you rather have a God like this to rescue you? See, so let me ask you, here today, in Britain rather than Babylon, but no less sheep-ish, isn't this the God you're looking for? The only one, the incomparable, who doesn't faint or grow weary, who, who knows, who, who understands everything, who gives strength to the weary and rescue to the exiled and forgiveness and pardon, an exact double for all my sin who says he will rescue sinful people and did when the Lord Jesus Christ came. For he always does what he says. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Chin up. Haven't you heard? God is up to it. So let me go back to that Christian leader right at the start and that question and answer session he was in about the suffering that he'd been through. And he was asked in the course of his interview, after the year that you've had, have these hardships that you faced, and as you look back on your life, all that sequence of things that have been very difficult in your life and ministry, have those hardships caused you to doubt God? Have they in any way unsettled you as a Christian? And his very striking answer was no, because he'd done the theological thinking beforehand. In other words, you need to grapple with this ahead of time, before hardship, so that you are ready and prepared, clear in your thinking before it happens. You may not be feeling verse 27 today, but chances are you will. Isaiah 40 was written as preventative medicine. It is written for us as preventative medicine. Take it now, spoonful by spoonful, so that hardship won't prove fatal later on. Fifty years ago, a book was published entitled, Your God is Too Small. Indeed he is. We reduce him. We shrink him. We compare him. We box him in. As Jim Packer says in his classic book, Knowing God, what we all need is to know God better, for knowing him is the antidote to that crippling disease of self-pity. Why don't you try reading Isaiah 40 every day? For a little while. I've tried to do it for the last three weeks. Why don't you try doing that? And for every statement that you read about God in this passage, compare that with what we can feel about God when things are tough. Take the medicine. The Christmas speech by the king in 1939, it wasn't a queen, it was a the king in 1939, his Christmas speech included these words. 
I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God, trod gladly into the night. And of course, what a dark year 1939 was. Who knows how dark 2017 might be? Wars, rumors of wars, terrorism, upheaval, political expectation upturned, insecurity. And for us in our own little worlds and empires, we don't know how dark it might be. Put your hand into the hand of this God. The hand that is competent to hold one billion trillion stars. Cling to his certain promises for what he says is forever. He says he will rescue sinful people. Never doubt that he can. Let's pray together, shall we? <clears throat> to whom will you liken God? What likeness compare with him? Our oh, Father God, we couldn't dare to compare you with anything. You are immense, majestic, awesome, glorious, far beyond our imagining, huge, powerful, reigning. Our oh, Father God, may we be astounded today by what we've just read and therefore absolutely confident that what you say that you will do. Your word will indeed stand forever. And we can cling with real confidence to the words of comfort that you speak to sinful people. Thank you for your promise that sheepish though we are, sinful people though we are, your promise is a promise that you make and stands through all time, that you are the one who provides rescue. Please may your word to us today strengthen us for whatever the future may bring to us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>